There are no purely value-free or technical solutions to urban problems. All decisions in spatial development are political decisions, insofar they must involve choice, negotiation, friction, divergence, and occasionally agreement that enables action. This is why we must discuss spatial justice. Spatial justice will provide us with a framework for action, but also with tools for urban development. It allows us to connect social justice and urban space. Spatial planners and designers have a very central role in achieving spatial justice. They can be shapers of innovative spatial and institutional relationships between civil society, the public sector, and the private sector. This is called a governance arrangement. We can be designers of inclusive processes of planning. Spatial planners and designers can act as enablers of the right to the city, which we will discuss later. Spatial justice is a relatively new area of study that focuses on mainly two types of justice, distributive justice and procedural justice. In distributive justice, justice is sought through the fair allocation of resources and services throughout the urban territory. In other words, resources and services and opportunities must be fairly distributed in urban space. In procedural justice, justice or injustice can be found in the planning processes themselves. They can also be found in participatory processes and the laws and regulations of a city. Justice here is in the procedures. In general, we associate spatial justice to democratization, participation, and with the concept of right to the city. This is because participation allows silent voices to be heard. Later in the course, you will analyze concrete cases of spatial justice and injustice in emerging economies and discuss how contemporary theories apply there. You can explore the bibliography attached for an in-depth analysis of the concepts explained here. Spatial justice matters because of the territorial or spatial dynamics of distribution of wealth, goods and opportunities. These are not evenly distributed throughout an urban territory. There are reasons why they are located in specific places in cities. There are features that categorize and differentiate the urban territory, such as land prices, environmental quality, access to public goods, and presence of infrastructure, and many more. The land market situates people in certain parts of the city, so the question I wish to answer is, does the urban territory determine the welfare of people? This course adopts the position that, yes, the spatial dimension of people's lives, rather than social relationships only, determines their welfare. Spatial justice is an integral part of social justice, and it includes issues like the right to housing, the right to healthy environments, and the right to affordable mobility. Most importantly, it also includes the right to the city itself. But what is the right to the city? What is justice? And what is the relationship between justice and space? In order to answer those questions, let's, let's explore how the relationships between justice, politics, and urban space has been conceived in history. It is outside the scope of this lecture to offer a definition of justice, but you can find excellent explanations in the references. There are numerous philosophical traditions in the discussion of justice. Utilitarianism, retributivism, even divine justice. But in, in most of these traditions, it is possible to find a spatial component related to how social relationships are organized in space. Plato's monumental work, The Republic, 
is a description of justice in the city. That is, a description of the just city-state and the just man who inhabits that city. For the Greeks, the polis was the place where citizens would congregate to govern their lives in order to attain the good life. The polis is the space of shared decision-making, otherwise known as politics. The words polis and politics come from the same root. An astute observer of his own society, Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, concluded that man is a political animal. We can only achieve the good life by living as citizens in organized societies, and in doing so, we become fully human, as opposed to animals in a state of nature. For Plato, on the other hand, the city is synonymous with society. It is in the city that men and women come together to decide how they are going to achieve life together. This tells us that a spatial dimension of justice is closely related to the spatial dimension of politics itself, which implies the city as a shared space where decisions must be taken by citizens together. Much like the Greeks, German-born political theorist Hannah Arendt's conception of politics is based on the idea of active citizenship, that is, on the value and importance of civic engagement and collective deliberation about all matters concerning the political community. The civic engagement happens in the city, where men and women must live together. By doing so, they create a political space where they can formulate demands, engage and associate. In this political space, men and women formulate a social contract, in the words of the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in which rights and duties are established and government is constituted. The concept of right to the city, first formulated by French philosopher Henri Lefebvre, is first anchored in this tradition. The right to the city is nothing less and nothing more than the active citizenship of the Greeks and Hannah Arendt. That is, the right to take part in the affairs of the city, to make decisions about one's own living environment, and therefore realize one's full potential as a human being. It is the right to shape the city to your own dreams, aspirations, and needs, so that your human potential will be fulfilled. More recently, David Harvey, a British scholar, has extensively written about this idea. According to Harvey, the right to the city is the right to actively shape the city to one's needs and desires, thus exercising one's full citizenship. In liberal democratic societies, public involvement in the affairs of the city is institutionalized through elected officials or through other forms of participation, including even the internet. But even in liberal democracies, the ability of citizens to interfere in the affairs of the city sometimes is limited. Cities are made of governance structures imbued with power and characterized by competing narratives, disagreement and agreement, and continuous negotiation. Evidently, there is also disparity of power. Some actors have a voice, while others simply don't. Hence, designing and planning the built environment are profoundly political activities in which power relationships must be continually exposed in order to create some chance for the less powerful to be heard. The procedures of planning and design must continually adjust to cope with constant change and the need to redistribute power among stakeholders, leading to the fair redistribution of resources, services and opportunities. To summarize, spatial justice is closely related to notions of procedural and distributive justice. Or in other words, it is closely related to how cities and regions are planned and governed 
and where resources and opportunities are allocated. It concerns fairness and transparency of planning processes, for instance, but also the capacity of those planning processes to include disadvantaged and vulnerable voices. Therefore, in order to achieve spatial justice, we must work towards sustainable governance and fair and inclusive spatial planning, which can hopefully deliver a fair redistribution of power leading to fair redistribution of resources and opportunities and the equitable and fair access to public goods.